talking to literally nobody because you all are at home. And while it's terrifying, it's also great. And while it's different, it can also be a blessing. We've made this choice to close church down to protect the vulnerable, the weak, the old, and the sick among us. Because we decided that our freedom in Christ together in worship doesn't take precedence over our freedom to care for and protect the weakest among us. And so we're here, but we're not here. And you're here, but you're not here. And somehow God makes it all kind of work together. And so we're here. I want to pray because this is a weird time and we know that God is present even in the midst of our weird time. Lord, we ask your blessing not just now during this moment we're making this piece of history, but we pray that you would be with it as it goes forward. May you be lifted up. May you draw all people unto you as we proclaim your goodness and your life. And as we talk about the hope that you have for so many of us who are broken, myself included. Amen. So, this is the message for this morning, Hope for the Broken. And I need hope because I am broken. If you've been in a relationship with anybody, you've been broken. I've been broken. They've been broken because eventually we all do something that hurts each other. There is no such thing as a perfect relationship because there is no such thing as a perfect person. And so, we're all broken. We've all hurt each other. And yes, we all need hope. I don't know where you're at today, and you don't know where I'm at, but we all have these hard places that we don't want to go. And I've always, I've always taken comfort in the fact that, well, the world says to each other, hey, don't go there. The church and Jesus Christ says, hey, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go to that place where you're most broken and most hurt, and I'm going to offer help and healing and hope. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Before we dig into this Bible story, though, I need to give you some history because unless you're like me, unless you're a nerd that went to seminary and Bible college, sometimes we read these Bible stories and we gloss over the facts and go, yeah, 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 this, 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 whatever, but we need to look at them. And so I need to tell you some facts because in this story, we have Jesus going into the region called Samaria. And you know who the biggest guy in the Bible was, right? The guy from Samaria, right? Because he was Samaria. Never mind. Bad joke. They'll probably edit that out, but what can I do? So Jesus goes into Samaria, and Samaria was a place that religious, observant Jews avoided like the plague. They would literally walk all the way around it. They would go from one point outside of it to another point outside of it, and rather than going A to B, quick line, they would go all the way around and so you have to know that in this Jesus story, his disciples were freaking out right away because he went through Samaria. And here's the thing. Samaritans, they were despised by the Jews. They, they had broken connection with each other um, during one of the times when the Jews were taken away in captivity. Some Jews snuck off and avoided captivity and uh, stayed behind and they became the Samaritans. They didn't follow all the rules. They didn't follow all the laws. And they were despised. And, and in this story, it's easy to get caught up in the religious stuff about where to worship and how to worship. And that's important stuff for a lot of us. But what I want to focus on this morning is the people that Jesus is reaching in this story. And, and one of them happens to be a woman. And I have to tell you, women were not okay back then. They were not seen as anything close to equal with men. Now, as a, as a man today, I can say, thank you, Jesus, that we've made so much progress. And maybe women hearing it are going, yeah, wow, I can't imagine what it would be like to not be seen equal with guys, to be mansplained and have everybody think I'm slightly less because I'm a woman and have people just always devalue me because I, whatever. So I get that we're not completely equal now, but, but let, and I need to just say this to you watching at home, if, if we're this far apart now, they were this far far apart then. And the idea that Jesus would just talk to this woman is earth shattering. He is going outside of every social and religious and, and, uh, and national norm that existed at the time to connect with a woman. And, and 
Worse, there were even a group of Pharisees. They were super hyper-religious, and they were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because this is how they would walk around the city. They'd walk around with their eyes down so they would never encounter a woman. Not just because of possible sinning or thinking a bad thought about her, but because if she were in that time of the month, and you never know when someone might be, and you made contact with her and bumped into her, you would be unclean. So they would literally bump into walls, and they would trip over things, and they would fall. And they wore their bruises and their blood as a badge of purity to say, look at me, I'm destroyed physically, but I haven't connected with a woman. And, and that's just a weird thing for us to get our heads around today. So this is where Jesus is walking into. Samaritans are horrible. Women are horrible. And speaking to a Samaritan woman, whoa, what are you doing, Jesus? Why would you do this? It was a huge, huge deal. Okay, so another problem that women had is it was super easy to get divorced in the first century Palestinian world that Jesus inhabited. Um, now, there are two schools of thought we're going to talk about. There are two schools or houses um, called Beit, or Beit, which is the Jewish word for house. The Jewish theological thought, and, and there were two of them in Jesus' time. Depending on which school of thought <coughs> a Jewish man followed, divorce could be for different reasons. Now, I know you're not going to get into this, but some of us like it. Beit Shammai held that a man may only divorce his wife for a serious transgression. And you and I would be behind that. We're like, yeah, let's not get divorced unless it's real. But even this was kind of superficial because Jesus said, unless you divorce your wife for sexual immorality, in other words, cheating on you, you're causing yourself to commit adultery. So even he said Shammai, the conservatives who said you can only divorce for serious reasons, that was still too loose for Jesus. But Beit Hillel allowed divorce for even trivial reasons. You could divorce your wife for something as small as burning a meal. And uh, that's the school of thought my wife came out of, which is why she refuses to cook at our house, and that's okay. But she's like, I'm not giving you the chance to leave me, which I wouldn't do because I married way above myself. So either way, all that was required, whether it was big or little, you just had to give your wife a written certificate of divorce. No muss, no fuss, no lawyers were needed. You literally just wrote it out. You also got no alimony and no divorce settlement, and the man kept everything. The woman was left with nothing. So divorce in this time was pretty brutal. And it wasn't like the woman could just say, hey, that's okay, I'm just going to go and start my own Etsy website and sell doilies. I mean, she was literally left with nothing. No food, no home, no shelter, and no way to earn a living. Okay, you need to get your head around that. Women commonly drew water early in the morning is the last thing I want to talk about. A woman would normally go to a well like 6 a.m. or what they called the first hour of the day. And there's a reason for that. I'm weird. I keep a bottle of water or a jar of water or a glass of water by my bedside. And if it's opened and it goes overnight, I don't want it. Because you've all had that morning water, right? You taste it and it's just kind of funky and weird. Like, what? what? What's going on? Nobody wants old water. And so a proper Jewish woman or Samaritan woman, they would go to the well super early in the morning. They would get it done while it was cool and you had your fresh water for the whole rest of the day. So you did that and your day was set. Hey, I did the hard part. I got the water, carried it home, and now I can just do the things I need to do. So if you're coming to the well at noon, and all this is going to make sense when we hear Jesus' story in a minute, it was to avoid shame and conflict. How many of us have been there, right? You know, uh, I don't really want to go to in hot water this week because they all know about that thing, that argument I got into, that thing I did, whatever. So I'm just going to avoid public spaces. I'm not going to go to the chamber meeting. I'm not going to go to the high school football game. I'm just going to kind of entomb myself in my house and let everybody talk about me. That's what this woman was going through. Got to tell you, I, I kind of know what that's like. It's tough sometimes. She wasn't going there because, hey, that's when my schedule had a minute free. She was going there to avoid shame and conflict. She didn't want to see the people from her village. She didn't want to encounter the other women. She certainly didn't want to encounter the men. And into this historical background, 
we pick up this story of Jesus. In the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter, we pick it up in verse 5. So he, Jesus, came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground, Joseph was given by his son Jacob. Ah! Yeah, I keep Take going three. if it was Sunday. Oh. Take three. <laughs> Sorry, Brent. That's okay. Anytime you want. And so this is the worldview that informs this great story about Jesus. We find it in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. So he, Jesus, came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew who the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and the other reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labors. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. 
And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Now, I need to talk to you for just a second. There are ten sermons worth of theological arguments and points and counterpoints in that story about Jesus. And we could argue about every single one of them. They're worth it if it helps us grow closer to God. But I think what we need to most here today, especially in this crazy world that we're finding ourselves in, where churches and schools and, and sporting events are all being closed down, cruise ships are docking off foreign ports and can't land, people are stranded in nations without help and hope, I think what we need to hear most right now isn't worship practices and mountains and spirit and truth. We need to encounter a Jesus that comes to those who are completely marginalized, on the edges of life, and says, I accept you. I know you. Because, let's be honest, that's where we live. Our fear isn't that our public persona isn't good enough. Because I have to say, and now that you can see me on video, not just audio, you have to admit, I look good. I mean, I got it going on, right? I clearly, I have a face for radio, right? I mean, but, but who am I inside when nobody else is around? That's what we're afraid of. We're afraid that, that will our friends, our spouses, our loved ones accept us when they realize who we really are. And Jesus knows who this woman really was. He said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He's like, yup. <laughs> You've been married five times. And you think she went, well, yeah, clearly. You saw that on Facebook. No. He knew because he was the Messiah, and she knew that and identified it. But she didn't really get down to business until she declared who he was and accepted that. It's not that he knew her, but she also acknowledged who God is. Now, let's be honest about another thing. What did you think, deep down inside, the place where you don't tell other people, the first time you heard this story and you heard of a woman who's been divorced five times and is now living with a guy who's not her husband, no one, I guarantee you, no one went, well, she sounds like just a delightful young woman. I hope my son can meet someone like that one day. Right? I mean, we're not going to say the words even though church is almost empty, but, you know, there's bad words that we attach to women that are like that. And that's not always right. Because we don't always know their stories either. And maybe, just maybe, Jesus is saying to all of us, that, that, that lady at the edge of town, what if you loved her first before you judged her? Because it's convenient to attach a label, but we don't always know who she was. Now here's what I can tell you. With everything in me, with everything I've studied, and I've been a professional Christian for a long time, I know this. She was not a woman with loose morals. Absolutely not. Because if she was, she would have been dead. In John 8, we read a story of a woman who was caught in adultery. She's brought before Jesus, and everybody wants to stone her, and Jesus says, yeah, that's, that's great, let's do that. Let's kill the lady. Um, hey, the person in, in, in the area that has never sinned, you go first. And Jesus doesn't condone her sin because as the men drop their rocks one after another and drift away, he looks at her and says, where are those who condemn you? And she says, they're gone. And he says, then neither do I. But then he closes with this phrase, go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. Jesus doesn't condone sexual sin. He calls it out when he needs to. And he never says a word to her. Why? If she'd been adulterous, Maybe once she might have gotten away with it. A husband who said, well, I really don't want to get her killed. I mean, she was nice until she cheated. I'll let her just drift off into the night. Five times? Absolutely not. So why did she keep getting divorced? What was she doing wrong? The most common reason a woman was divorced in this time period is this. Infertility. And this is brutal. Can you imagine being a woman and all you want to do is have a family? And I know some people at our church know this pain and some people at our church know this joy of having overcome this. But a woman in that time couldn't go to a doctor, didn't understand what was going on. All she knew is she got married, probably young. I mean, super young by today's standards. Maybe 15. 
her mom and her dad come to her and say, hey, have we got good news for you. Levi, the rug merchant in town, he wants to marry you. And she's like, okay. But she goes forward. She gets married. She does the wifely thing, the cooking, the cleaning, the other stuff. And inside, she's like, I'm sure I'm going to get pregnant. I'm sure I'm going to give my husband a, a, a child and hopefully a son so we can continue the lineage. And, and over and over, she's not pregnant. And so the husband divorces her. And the second husband, who she has to marry, because she can't just go back to mom and dad. She can't just go start up her own business. She can't say, that's fine. I'm going to be an independent first century Palestinian woman living in Samaria. I'm going to have my own place. And I'll have my own thing. No. She couldn't own property. She couldn't have a shop. She had to find a husband. But at the back of her head for number two, she's like, gosh, I sure hope it was my husband's problem, not mine. And then that second marriage ends with no kids. And that husband divorces her. And she goes into marriage number three, right? Third time's the charm. Except it wasn't. And she gets divorced again for the fourth time and the fifth time. And eventually she goes so far down the social ladder of that time that she can't even get married. She can't even get married to a guy who could divorce her with a piece of paper saying, you burnt my food. He won't even give her the honor of that legal protection. He's just living with her. And Jesus knows this, and he sees this, and he talks to her anyway. He violates every single social norm for a Jew, for a man, for a rabbi, and he connects with her and says, I've got something you need. And when she gets bogged down in, I want water, do you have water? You don't have a scoop, how do we do this? He cuts right to it, he's like, nope. I'm the Messiah. The one who you're listening to is the one you've been waiting for. I am he. Can you imagine how she felt before she encountered Jesus? Have you ever been in her shoes? I mean, not literally, metaphorically, or metaf you know, metaphorically, have you ever been there? Have you ever been in this kind of spot? Have you ever been broken? Have you ever had plan A crash so hard that you can't even find enough fragments to get to plan B. You're, you're dropped like all the way to plan like J because it's just broken you so badly. Have you ever been ashamed? Have you ever had that thought where you're like, I seriously would rather starve to death in my home than go into town and buy groceries because everybody there knows what I did. I had a kid say that. He missed a field goal and he's like, if it weren't for that miss, my team would have made it to state. And I said, well, that was the last seven seconds of the game, man. There was like almost an hour before that where your team should have scored a lot more. It's not your fault. Do you know that kind of brokenness? Where you think it's all you and everybody hates you? Have you ever been despised? That kid felt despised. Who knows what it is for you? But have you ever felt despised? I know she did. How about abandoned? There's a really cheesy country song, If the phone doesn't ring, it's me. Have you ever been in that spot where the phone isn't ringing and it's everybody you've ever known dropping you? You text, they don't answer. You even get the little bubbles. You know they got it, you know they're thinking about a reply, and then the bubbles go away and there's no reply. That kind of abandoned? It's tough. Have you ever been victimized? Have you ever been in that spot where everything bad that happened had nothing to do with you? It's not because of what you wore or said or where you went or what you did. You were just in the wrong spot and somebody horrible hurt you. And because of that, other people look at you badly. You were the victim and you get re-victimized every time it comes up. Have you ever felt powerless? Have you ever, have you ever felt like, okay, the entire world's against me and I don't even have one person by my side. Nothing about this works. Nothing about this is any good. That's how that lady felt, all five of those things. The very thing her body was created to do, and, and I gotta admit, ladies, I'm impressed. You make a human being from scratch. I don't know how you do it. And you know she wanted to. 
and couldn't. Can you imagine that feeling where the one thing you want to do, the one thing your body is supposed to be able to do without thinking, we don't think ourselves pregnant, it's just a biological reality, and she could do nothing to fix it? She was broken. She was ashamed. She was despised. She was abandoned. She was victim. And she was powerless. And Jesus comes to her anyway. And the beauty of it is, he doesn't come as Lord saying, let me tell you what's up. He extends an olive branch, pun intended, and says, can I get a drink of water? And a dialogue begins. Well, you know what? Jesus comes to you and meets you where you are right now. No matter what is going wrong with your life, no matter how you're broken or ashamed or despised or abandoned or victimized or powerless, Jesus comes to you and he doesn't come as as some overarching powerful figure ready to be another bad news voice in your world. He comes to you when you're broken. And he comes to bring you hope. I need it. You need it. Jesus interacted with her despite her painful past. And this radical acceptance and love caused her to run to town and to declare who Jesus really is. Now think about that. She left her water and entered into the very group of people she had been avoiding to tell them about Jesus. Typos aside behind me. My fault. Nobody else. I'm broken, I'm powerless, I can't even type right. But you know what? Her pain became her power. Her past became her testimony. She didn't run into town and say, forget my past, I want to tell you something new. She said, come meet a man who told me everything I've ever done. And she wasn't excited about it because it was still bad. She was excited about it because his radical love and acceptance of her washed that away. And he said, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you've been waiting for. And I sat down and and, and wanted to have a drink of water with you. Listen again to what happened because of her. John 4. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever did. So many, that's a lot, many of them believed in him. And then we read more. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more came, became believers. So here's the thing. We're not just supposed to take Jesus in and shut it down and say it ends here. We're supposed to take Jesus in and run and tell everybody. And this lady goes and tells everybody because such amazing things happened. And then they acted on it and Jesus moved more and and more and more people believed. Jesus offers you hope. And he asks you to share it with the world. It's not enough that we find hope and keep it because we aren't the only broken ones. You aren't the only broken one. I'm not the only broken one. And when we find hope in Him, He asks us to share it with the world. And church, there has never been a more important time. This is literally becoming the the global health crisis of our time. And it's a time you can share hope. It's a time when you can share instead of hoard, pray instead of be in fear, love instead of isolate, And I know Jesus wants us to do that. Let's pray. God, we give you this word that you have given us and we ask that it would grow in our hearts. Help us to find the courage to let you talk to us. And when we've heard all the things that we've done, when we've heard all of it, help us to get to a point where we can see you as the Messiah. And when we realize we are radically loved and accepted right where we're at, help us to run into town and tell everybody. And Jesus, we know that you will do a work in our midst as we are faithful in sharing the hope that we as broken people have found in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Every week at at Lake Union, we close with a benediction. And I'd like to just share it with you now as we...
go about the rest of our week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and to give you his peace. Wherever you are, whatever is going on in your life, may God bless you and keep you. Amen.